So this is a heating curve showing the whole, whole business, the melting and the boiling. So we're looking at water here, and this is drawn to scale for one mole of water. So if we take water at minus 25 degrees Celsius, that is below the freezing point, so that will be ice. If we add heat to the ice, the temperature of the ice will increase until it begins to melt. And at that point, the uh, temperature will remain zero until all the ice has melted. We can calculate the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of the ice and that's using something from chapter 6, Q equals MC delta T. So the change in temperature, the specific heat capacity of the substance, the mass of the substance, that's the amount of energy needed to change the temperature. So that's going to happen, that equation will apply to um, this line 1. Line 2 here, we have melting. There's not really an equation for that. We're just going to use the heat of fusion. So I guess we would call this number one. In line two, you're gonna use the heat of fusion. So you're gonna take the amount of the substance in moles, multiply by the heat of fusion, and that will give you the amount of energy that's needed to completely melt that amount. When we get to line three, we have heating occurring again. And every time we have heating, we've got Q equals MC delta T. This C, though, is a different C because water has a, liquid water has a different heat capacity than solid water. So we can calculate the amount of energy needed to warm the water from um, having just melted at zero up to 100 degrees where it begins to boil. Line four shows the water boiling, going from liquid to a gas. And so there, to calculate the amount of energy there, we're going to need the heat of vaporization. The heat of vaporization is much higher, and that's why this line segment is much longer, because it takes a lot more energy to boil that amount of water than it did to melt it. Once all the water has gone into the gas state, um, then we've got Q equals MC delta T again. And we can calculate how much energy is needed to change the temperature from 100 degrees to 125 degrees. And the 125 is just chosen for the illustration. If we want to know how much energy is um, been used from this point at minus 25 all the way up to here at uh, 125. We have to calculate the energy change for each line segment and add them together. Does that make sense? And up here we have illustrations of what's, what's going on with the particles. So let's do an example, and this is actually calculating the thing that was on that previous slide. Calculate the amount of heat needed to take one mole of ice at minus 25 degrees Celsius to steam at 125 degrees Celsius. Um, so information like this, the specific heat capacities, heat of vaporization, heat of fusion, would either be given to you or would be on the information sheet on an exam. On a homework problem or an experiment, you might have to look it up in your textbook. So we need to draw a heating curve. It doesn't need to be to scale, but we need to just sketch something out so that we can identify how many different things are we talking about here. So I'm just gonna sketch one out way up here at the top. So this is energy being added, and this is temperature going up. And so we're starting at minus 25, and we're going up to 125. So that's 
at minus 25, that's below the freezing point, so that's solid ice. And so we're gonna warm that up until it begins to melt. Then we'll have a flat place where the water's melting. And then the temperature will go up again until we get to the boiling point. And then we'll have a flat place again as the water is transitioning from liquid to a gas, and then the temperature will rise again once it's all in the gas state. Now this is not to scale at all, but it helps us to see how many equations do I need here? We should identify the temperatures here, so that's zero degrees Celsius, and this would be 100 degrees. So that's the boiling point of the liquid. This is the melting point of the solid. So I've got several line segments here. I'm just going to number them. One, two, three, four, and five. And for each line segment, I'm gonna have a separate equation. The ones that are angled, there's a temperature change occurring. And that's Q equals MC delta T. The flat places are heat of fusion and heat of vaporization. So let's just start at the beginning and calculate for line one. So here we're gonna use Q equals MC delta T. So we need the mass of this. We're told that we've got one mole of ice. So one mole of, of ice, solid water. Um, we can convert that to mass using the molar mass. So that's 18.02 grams. So the mass here, 18.02 grams. We need the specific heat capacity. So this is for ice. So we need to choose the correct C here. We want C for the ice. That's 2.09 joules per gram degree Celsius. Oops. 2.09 joules per gram degree Celsius. And then delta T. Remember that delta T is the final minus the initial. So we're just looking at this specific line segment, the final temperature is zero, the initial temperature is minus 25. So the change in temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. This is for ice to go uh, to warm up to the melting point. Yeah, so nothing's melted yet, but we're just warming up the ice. So we can do the math there. And in this problem, I'm assuming that one mole of ice means exactly one mole of ice. Um, these temperatures, zero and 100, um, could be considered exact numbers as well. So I'm just gonna go with the three sig figs based on the specific heat capacities. So 18.02 times 2.09 times 25. Um, so 941.54 joules. So the, we see that the units work out here, the grams cancel, the degrees Celsius cancel and I get a unit of joule. So for line segment two, this is horizontal. If you try to use Q equals MC delta T, the temperature changes zero, and so that's not gonna work out. You're just gonna end up with zero. Here we need the heat of fusion because this is melting. So we're going to take the amount of substance in moles we were told we have one mole of water, one mole times the heat of fusion, 6.02 kilojoules 
her mole. And that math is pretty easy. And this is 6.02 kilojoules. Line segment three, we've got a temperature change occurring again. We've got the melted ice, the liquid water, going from the melting point up to the boiling point. Q equals MC delta T. So the mass isn't changed. It's 18.02 grams. The specific heat capacity, though, we need to use the one for water, the liquid. So 4.18 joules per gram degrees Celsius. And then what's the temperature change here? 100. We're going from zero degrees to 100 degrees. We take the final temperature, it's 100, and subtract the initial zero, and so the temperature change is 100 degrees Celsius. So the grams cancel, the degrees Celsius cancel. 18.02 times 4.18 times 100. 7532.3. So again, I'm keeping three significant figures for these guys, and that's joules. Then we calculate the energy change for line segment four. This one's horizontal again. This is a state change. And so here we have vaporization at the boiling point. So we have one mole times the heat of vaporization, which is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. And so that's going to be 40.7 kilojoules. The math doesn't always end up that easy, but here we're doing one mole. Then we have line, bless you, line segment five. We have a temperature change again. So we've got the mass times the specific heat capacity. Now we're looking at steam, 2.01 joules per gram degrees Celsius. And the temperature change here, our final temperature is 125 degrees. The initial temperature for this segment is 100. And so that temperature change is 25 degrees. More units work out again, grams and degrees Celsius all cancel out. 18.02 times 2.01 times 25. 905.50 joules. So a mistake that students frequently make is they use the entire temperature change, the 125 and minus 125, and so they end up with 150 degrees, and they'll use that temperature change for all of these. Remember that you're calculating the energy for a line segment, not the whole thing. You can't do the whole thing at once. You have to do individual pieces. We've done the pieces, now we have to add them up. It's important to include units because in this calculation, we end up with units of kilojoules and this one we have joules. You can't add joules to kilojoules, you have to convert. So since we're gonna end up with a pretty large number, let's convert everything to kilojoules before we add them together. So here, converting to kilojoules, this is going to be 0.94154 kilojoules. And this one is going to be 7.5323 kilojoules. I'm dividing by 1,000 is what I'm doing. And this one is 0 0.90550 kilojoules. So I'm going to take those and add them together. I've got 0 0.94154 plus 6.02 plus 7.5323 plus 40.7 plus 
plus 0 0.90550. So the sum of all of those is 56.09934 kilojoules. For significant figures, what we're doing here is we're adding. When we're adding, we're looking at the number that has the fewest decimal places. Um, so we're looking at where is the last significant figure. This is, I've underlined them. So this last significant figure is in the third decimal place. This is in the second decimal place. This one's in the second decimal place. This one's in the first decimal place. So this one so far is winning in terms of having the fewest, and this is also in the third decimal place. So if I line them all up, I'm going to end up with the uncertainty in that first decimal place. And so I should round my answer, and I'm going to end up with 56.1 kilojoules of energy to take one mole of water at minus 25 to steam at 125. Any questions? There are lots of variations of this problem. So this is going all the way from a cold solid to a hot gas. You can also have any combination in between. So we could start with ice at zero and go up to water at 50 degrees Celsius. We could start with hot steam and cool it down to liquid water at room temperature. We could go the other way. So you need to draw, just sketch it out, doesn't have to be pretty, just sketch out what transitions you have so that you know how many segments you've got. Yes? So if it did ask, it had the same problem but asked us to do it reverse, mm -hmm. it would essentially be the same number, just negative. Exactly. Yeah. So. If you're going from a high temperature to a low temperature, you can do all the calculations that way and come up with the correct answer, but it tends to be a bit confusing with all the subtracting and stuff. So what I think is easier is just to always do the calculation with increasing temperatures and then recognize, okay, if I'm going the other way, I'm just going to take my number here and put a minus in front of it. Okay. So all the calculations can be done in the same way every time. And then at the end, am I going positive? Is it getting warmer? Leave it alone. Is it getting colder? Put a minus in front of it. Okay. Any other questions?